and it still maintains the income as a positive return. And then, of course, what I referenced a little bit ago was 1031 exchanges, meaning I can shelter my proceeds from a sale and I can roll it over into another investment. And lo and behold, I don't have to pay taxes on that proceed. Welcome to Keeping Tax. I'm Tab the Croc. And every Monday, I talk to someone here in North Idaho, the goal to connect more people in the Coeur d'Alene area. And then every Friday, I talk to someone outside the community to bring in a new perspective and to learn a little bit about yourself. Do you love Pacific Northwest as much as I do and want to show it off everywhere you go? I have the best apparel for you. Go to Forever Green PNW. So that's Forever E R G R N P N W. Uh, dot com or on their social media and go check them out. They have the best apparel. They have sweatshirts, they have hoodies, they have tees, they have swimsuits. They've got all kinds of great things to represent the Pacific Northwest. And they also are doing something really cool, little deals with their hoodies. So go check out them. They're fantastic and have a fantastic day. All right. I have Joe with me. And if you follow my podcast, if you've listened, I've had Joe on before. Um, he works for Windermere uh, Real Estate and he does commercial real estate, which is really, really cool because in our area, if you know the Coeur d'Alene area, North Idaho, Spokane, Liberty Lake, we're saturated with realtors, but not so much commercial real estate. Cause I was talking to another business owner the other day and they're like, man, it is sometimes hard to find good commercial real estates. A lot of people are doing the residential. So We're going to talk about the new trends coming up. We're going to talk about 2022, maybe how you can invest. So first of all, Joe, thanks so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And good morning to you. So first of all, we know know a little bit of your background, but kind of just refresh us on what your background is and what you do. Yeah. Well, first of all, commercial real estate, sort of a simple definition is any real estate that produces profitable income. There is some real estate, commercial real estate, that isn't necessarily profitable, but I wouldn't encourage you to invest in that. So I'm going to limit my focus to profitable uh, income. (laughs) And what I do, what I do is I help people find those investments and I help them vet those investments and I help them either enter or exit those investments. Uh, My personal background is I've had... um, A business major, undergraduate business major. I was a lawyer for a bit and reformed for several years. And then I've been a business person again. And now I've been practicing commercial real estate based here locally in Coeur d'Alene for uh, 17 years. Wow. That's right. 17 years, man. It's been a long time. Yeah, no kidding. I'm not sure I like to say that very often because it reminds me that the clock is ticking, but it's, it's been a good, it's been a good 17 years. Yes. And you're, you're doing great. Obviously um, it's fantastic. So tell us a little bit now. Um, so you're, you're with Windermere, right? And then you are. Yes. You're, my broker. Yes. Uh, my, my broker, technically you have to hang your license. You have to hang your license with broker. And it made more sense for me to associate with a broker than be my own broker. So my broker is Windermere and I'm licensed in both Idaho and Washington. And so we have affiliation with brokers in in Washington as well. But then quite frankly, I could even do a national reach through a network of referrals. And so it's not common to work out of the Pacific Northwest. It's possible. Um, because you can work with uh, local agents and do a referral network. So that's possible too. That's fantastic. So Mm -hmm. real estate market has been crazy, especially in our area. Um, Tell us kind of a little bit about like what you see coming up here in 2022, Um, maybe some different trends. Are we like, are we getting about to burst or are things still looking good? Tell us a little bit about what's kind of happening right now in the market. Yeah, Yeah, good question. Um, No, I don't think we're about to burst. I don't think we've hit the limit where we're about ready to burst or the bubble's going to burst. I think the enthusiasm and the demand for investment real estate is going to continue very strong. Mm-hmm. What seems to be fueling that is a motivation on a lot of people's parts to relocate from high, high cost states, such as California, of course, and 
to some extent Washington or at least the coast of Washington to, uh, to the Coeur d'Alene area where the cost basis is still more modest. And the other thing is because we have a high demand, we also are able to still offer um, pretty, pretty moderate return rates. Return rates meaning, of course, what kind of return do I get on my investment? I use an example, right? If you buy a product, a real estate building um, for $100,000 in Seattle, the return is going to be about 3%. So you kind of say, well, big deal, right? That's what's that, $3,000. However, if you were to buy that same product here, your return is going to be about 5 to 6%. And so on a real-time basis, you invest $100,000, you're getting back, and this is net profit, by the way, you're getting back five dollars or $6,000 of real uh, income. And so the, the demand is high. A lot of people want to relocate here. And of course, that fuels the demand. But more importantly, the other thing that's happening in the market is when people sell commercial real estate, no matter where they sell it, for example, if you own apartment buildings in California and you want to relocate to Idaho and you want to sell your apartment buildings in California, in order to avoid a taxable event, and in many cases it can be a big taxable event um, because you know, you're paying capital gains on the proceeds, in order to avoid that, people have a, a, a tax mechanism uh, called a 1031 exchange where they can reinvest here and they can shelter the proceeds. So you take your $500,000 of proceeds coming out of California, you buy something here for at least 500 or more, and then all of that 500,000 proceed is sheltered. It's deferred until some point in the future. And so, you know, that's, that creates a lot of incentive too. People say, hey, wait a minute, I'd rather reinvest in an investment than pay my taxes now. I mean, that doesn't make sense. So that, that fuels a lot of demand too. 1031 money, 1031 money. That's good to know. Um, mm -hmm. With that, and like you said, the apartment, obviously apartment buildings are always a hot item because you're going to need yes. those. But um, yes. what about like business space? I mean, in the big cities right now, like a lot of people aren't working in the office as much. Are you seeing right. anything here or is there a lot of people like investing in office space and those kind of things as well? Yeah. Yeah. Another good question. Um, a rebound from the COVID trends. There was a softening in office space demand because we've sort of taught ourselves to work at home as I am right now. Um, we sort of taught ourselves to work at home, but I, I, I still see a fairly strong demand because there's still a lot of professional services, medical practices and um, those sorts of things that require a little more in-person touch. And so the demand has been fairly stable. Um, business demand for buildings or opportunities to, to uh, be an owner user. I mean, if you're an accountant, for example, and you're looking for a space or spaces to accommodate your firm, then with the growth of areas such as ourselves comes a little increased demand because with more people, there are more accountants, et cetera, et cetera. And then so that's kind of fueling the demand as well. Yeah. And so it's stable. A short answer is the office market is stable. That's cr that's mm -hmm. crazy. So what other kind of um, commercial real estate do you do or do you help people invest sure. in? Well, because we're a relatively small market, I have to, I have to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a little bit of a subspecialty or a lot of bit of a subspecialty, I should say, in hospitality, particularly hotels. That's right. And so, for example, um, if you wanted to purchase a hotel or sell a hotel for that matter, uh, historically and to this day, the valuations are always based on a multiple of the gross sales. So for example, let's say your hotel is, is generating $2 million of gross sales. During COVID, the multiples had gone pretty low because COVID really pulled the rug out from underneath hotels because of lack of travel and what have you. And so if you were trying to buy a hotel a year and a half ago, two years ago, you would have paid about 3X the uh, gross sales, $6 million. Today, with the rebound of traveling and the rebound of you know, more proactive management of COVID, 
what's happening is, is that those multiples are going up. And so today you can see multiples of four or five. And just imagine the math. Four times two is eight. So that's two million more. Five times two is 10. So that's four million more. And so in the hospitality business and the hotel business, it's a great example um, because every, all the valuations are based on a multiple of those sales. And so that's a pretty vibrant market. And even locally in the Coeur d'Alene area, I mean, I, I have to maintain some confidentiality because I happen to be involved in a few, but publicly you can see some hotels going up um, where the old Outback Steakhouse was. I mean, that's gonna be an 88 room hotel. Yeah, and there are one or two others that are planned. And so, you know, we, we're, we're following the demand curve. Yeah, that is crazy. I know, I was talking to someone from the Coeur Resort and usually right. they're, like they're off season and right. they don't have an off season anymore. We live in a state that's like very pretty open. And so a lot of people yeah. are traveling here just for vacation. And it is yeah. crazy. Like we used, to, I used to get cheap rooms at the resort and now it's like, yeah, they're booked. <laughs> Let me know if you can get cheap rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Pass on a friend, a friend and family rate. But yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. You know, and another area I should mention, obviously I, I talked about hospitality and uh, hotels and what have you, which is restaurants included. But another area that, that's growing in demand because people are relocating here and the demand for services continues to be high um, is industrial. You know, contractors and electricians and trades folks they're all growing their businesses because we can't build enough houses uh, fast enough. And so everybody that's in the building industry and related is, is generally expanding their business. And there's a lot of transition from used to be a tenant where I was renting my space to now I not only can I afford, but it makes a lot more sense mm -hmm. to buy an industrial space, a, a big building with some amenities and then run my business out of there. And so we're seeing quite a bit of that as well. Um, the demand for industrial exceeds the supply quite a bit. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, um, that's a good healthy economic. And, but you know, the good, of course, the good news is it's a it's a good healthy economic um, indicator. Yeah, we got we got a lot of jobs. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of jobs. You know, our, by the way, our unemployment rate. You may know this, but in Idaho, our unemployment rate is one of the lowest it's ever been. Um, that's, that's the good news. The bad news is the same thing. It's one of the lowest it's ever been. So a lot of times it's hard to find and keep staff. Or, <laughs> so you know, it's a little bit of a, yeah. It's a exactly. A bit of a double edge, but. <laughs> it, well, and we all know, like, you know, if you yeah. live around here and you want to buy a house and you've lived here forever, things have changed. Or if, if you are in that construction industry, you have a great job. You are going to be booked out oh, for yeah. months and months yeah. because it oh, is yeah. insane. Well, you know, in, in my business, a lot of times we have to associate with contractors and trade folks, um, not only to build the product that the person that the buyer is intending, but also to inspect the product that the buyer is intending to buy. And a lot of times, you know, the answer is, is, well, what year did you want me to come out? <laughs> when did you want that? Oh, I, was, I was thinking like tomorrow. <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah, you're like, no, no, you're out to 2023. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please don't make me call a roofer, please. I'll never get one. <laughs> so. Exactly, exactly. So no. I want to go back to a part you said, the confidentiality. This is something I've yeah. kind of like, you and I have talked about this with the social media stuff, but why is that, that there's, there's certain things you can like, make public and you can't with certain deals or things that are listing. Right. Well, the basic issue is a lot of buyers, even buyers of vacant buildings, they don't want to expose the fact that they are in the market looking for something, primarily because they could almost shoot themselves in the foot because they're sort of alerting other prospective buyers to the fact that, hey, this building's available. Yeah. And so e even though you might be under contract, people like to maintain a confidentiality of not knowing who it is and the fact that you know, XYZ construction company is growing their business. And so it's, it's, it's a way to sort of avoid exposing yourself to the competitors. Another big issue of confidentiality is to respect the employee's um, anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, for example, if a hotel is uh, being purchased or sold, you know, you've got maybe 100 employees in the hotel and you don't want to raise alarms and cause a, uh, you know, a surge of, of leaving because that's not, that's not appropriate. And there's really no need to. I mean, hotel buyers don't come in and clean house, no pun intended. They don't come in and clean house. They realize that the big asset is the people that are supporting the hotel service. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to respect the confidentiality. And so you don't want to um, raise alarm. Uh, and so that's they're the basic reasons for the confidentiality. And you have to be quite careful. Um, I can't understate how much or how important it is to a lot of developers and buyers to maintain a confidentiality because they don't want um, they don't want any any predispositions or anything to influence the transaction that makes we do that i mean and that and that's a very professional part of what we do you know things don't travel things don't travel they have to i have to be trusted and earn the trust that i'm that things aren't going to travel um so that's that makes- one of the things we do that makes a lot of sense. I've always wondered that. I was like, why do they, I mean, because there's things that, you know, we talk about posting on social media and you're like, I can't post this. We can put this out there. And I'm always like, yeah. oh, that, that makes complete sense, especially the yeah. if you're taking over a whole business like a hotel and you want to keep the, all the employees, you want to stress them out that they're going to come in and just yeah. change everything. Yeah. And after the fact, you know, Idaho in particular is a, is a non-disclosure state. So Idaho in particular doesn't require you to list the sale price. Uh, and so I, I still have to respect, even post-closing, I still have to respect the buyer's uh, preference. Um, and so it's not uncommon to have a lot of those sales go unreported. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's okay. It, 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 the, the only reason for reporting sales in the public markets is for the real estate broker or the agent to get production credit. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it doesn't really affect anything other than maybe give people some competitive information about what hotel A sold for versus B, et cetera. But uh, yeah, confidentiality is, is, is a big part of, of our uh, responsibility. That's amazing. Um, so if someone's listening and they want to know their first time investor and they want to invest, start investing in commercial real estate, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give someone that's a brand new investor coming into sure. commercial real estate? Sure. Well, for, uh, th- uh, thanks for the question. I've thought about that, obviously, partly in anticipation of our, our discussion this morning. The first thing I would do is I would ask them or I would talk with them about the different asset classes of investment. Um, wealth management managers and firms, they do not advise people about investments in real estate simply because they don't get paid for it. They're going to push the products that they are getting paid for, stocks, bonds, um, currencies, commodities, and, you know, the, the, that range of products. So, so, excuse me. So first and foremost, what I would do is I would take people through some of the distinctions of investing in real estate versus investing in other asset classes. And I would probably first point out that a big distinction is cash flow. Meaning, of course, if you're buying an apartment building, for example, then you're also buying an income stream based on the rents. Compare that with a stock, you don't really get an income stream unless it's a dividend stock, but it's not very, it's pretty modest, whatever it is. Um, And so A, you have real cash flow. B, you have huge tax advantages because you get depreciation schedules, you get write-offs of your, any uh, financing interest if you finance, uh, and you get uh, write-offs of all the expenses, including management, uh, for the property. And so that offsets a lot of the income and it still maintains the income as a positive return. And then of course, what I referenced a little bit ago was 1031 exchanges, meaning I can shelter my proceeds from a sale and I can roll it over into another investment. And lo and behold, I don't have to pay taxes on that proceeds. I can continue to let it grow. So one, the first thing I'd probably do is take them through briefly a little comparison about the pros and cons of real estate versus other asset classes. And then the second thing was I'd get a little bit deeper into the investments and I would take them through what kind of returns they can expect in various uh, commercial real estate products. For example, let's go back to apartments. 
I mentioned earlier that in Seattle, uh, people are buying apartment projects with a 3% return. And that means they're paying a premium price because if I'm the owner and a seller and I'm only giving you in return a 3% return, that means me, the seller, is going to get a lot higher price. And so you say to yourself, well, wait a minute. Here in Coeur d'Alene and here in the surrounding area, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, um, you can expect 5% return here. And so I educate them as to what sort of return rates they can expect. And then also reiterate the fact that that's my obligation to vet availability, even though it's limited, to vet availability and present ones that are going to present a market return. And so I educate them as to what sort of return rates, uh, both absolute and in comparison. And there's a little bit of variety between the uh, return rates for office uh, investments, for industrial investments, et cetera. But it, it typically is going to range in our market five to 7% returns. And so, you know, that compares with buying real estate in other markets, but also compares with returns on other asset classes. The S&B, for example, and the Dow Jones, you may know, has been basically flat or a little bit down, about a, a point and a half or so down this year. Not so surprising because it had some pretty go-go years. You know, it went up pretty double figure for a bit for like two years. And so now it's sort of plateaued or it's adjusting. But for example, that's, that's the kind of discussion we would have. And then probably third and importantly is how to finance it. Um, okay, fine. I want to buy an apartment building. That's good for you. Thank you. Um, I know I want to buy an apartment building because of the reasons we talked about a moment ago. Secondly, I like and I'll accept a five or six percent return rate because I think that's a steady, more stable. And then thirdly is, well, how do I go about buying it? Um, OK, one way is you just move your proceeds into um, this project. And even if the proceeds aren't enough to cover the full purchase of the project, you can get financing and commercial financing is different than residential, but you can expect commercial financing. You have to be prepared to have 30 or 35% down. Yeah. Um, and the other thing you have to be prepared for is um, the interest rates are about a point higher than residential interest rates. Uh, the third and final thing is the amortization period. The amortization period for residential loans, of course, everyone knows can be 30 years, whereas in commercial it's 20 years. So you have to do the computations about what that means from a cash flow standpoint. And so there's always the question or the discussion, unless you just have cash, is how can I go about financing these things? Um, if, however, you're talking about an owner user situation, like I'm buying a hotel or I'm buying a restaurant, or I'm buying an assisted living facility, which is also in high demand, then you have a broader variety of financing available. The federal government will guarantee loans within their small business administration department. And so that allows consumers and buyers to purchase commercial real estate at lower percentage down payment, can be as low as 10%, a lot of times it's 20-ish, but you could could be as low as 10%, which is a big deal. You know, you buy a million dollar uh, restaurant and you know, 10% is uh, $10,000, right? Instead of 30. Um, and so, or no, 10% is 100,000, pardon me. Uh, 100,000, gotta get those zeros lined up. Uh, and so you get a lower, you get a lower percentage down, Yahoo. You get a interest rate that is fixed for up to 10 years uh, versus commercial loans that are generally fixed three to five years. So Yahoo, especially in these days of lower interest rates. And then the third thing you get is you can almost always get a 25 year amortization as opposed to a 20. So the third Yahoo is I get more cash flow because my monthly payments are less Ta -da! and no prepayment penalties either. So, you know, if, if you are an owner user, don't hesitate um, and, I, and I help everybody through all those processes. I don't just turn them loose or, you know, point them in a direction. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a transactions coach along the way. And so we, we have those discussions and we facilitate all those through the resource network I have. Wow, that's so, awesome. 
Yeah, you want to buy some? What do you think? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, you ready? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> well, is there? I mean, is there anything out there right now that like you have um, can like talk about like publicly? Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I wish there were. But no. I mean, I, I have a couple. I have a couple small projects, fourplex, and a. And a, and a that is is in is listed and it's pending and it's going to close but then the other projects that i'm currently working on are under the uh, radar and so i can't really uh, talk about them very much but there it's a good pipeline it's a good pipeline and it reflects the demand it's fantastic it's a yeah. good problem to have yeah it really is it really is the hard part is just you know zipping it <laughs> you're so, excited about it i'm good at that exactly <laughs> Exactly. So let's talk. With you. So what would you like? Maybe we could. Maybe yeah, we could exactly. We'll talk through. about yeah. that. We'll switch <laughs> roles. <laughs> exactly. So um, I know it's hard to predict the future, but do you see any changes or things happening within this next year? Or do you kind of see it just kind of staying the same? Generally, I'm, I'm, I'm predicting it's going to stay the same. It's going to be stable. The things that affect the uh, commercial world are more economic indicators, like interest rates, um, and uh, so, and ta and tax and changes in tax law. That's a big deal. And you know, if there were to be a spike in interest rates, or even 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 an uptick, not necessarily a spike, and if there were to be some tax uh, changes like the removal of 1031s, which is somewhat being proposed, then that would, that would of course slow down. That would slow down commercial investments because there's less incentive to do it. There's less profit margin to do it. And the other thing is, you know, with higher interest rates, the economy sort of taps the brakes and it slows down in general. And so all the people that are framers and all the electricians are slowing down because the housing industry is is slowing down. And that makes sense. So, you know. All right, a couple fun questions since we've been talking all the yes, real estate. Um, so do you have a, so I'm, for my new year, I'm working on like more of the, you know, reading into like mental health and, you know, business and things like that. Do you have any books currently you're reading or that maybe you, you're going to read that you can um, give to us? Uh oh can I, can we pause this and I'll Google and get back to you in a moment? <laughs> quick, quick, put this on pause. <laughs> Shoot. I, <laughs> um, I stumped you. Boy, I know you stumped the band. I know I should have a good answer for that, but I don't. Um, I mean, I do do a lot of reading. Most, so what, most of what I read is based on um, network reports put out by local economists or other big uh, national brokerage firms because they do periodic, almost monthly market assessments and analyses and things like that. And so I do a lot of reading of, of updated information, but um, a, a, little, a little shy on sort of some of the, uh, some of the book material. Oops. Perfect, no, the reason I ask is for my own selfish. I'm like, what are the good okay. books to read? So um, no, great answer. Um, that makes sense with what you're doing kind of to keep up to trends. Like a book isn't keeping up the trends, but you're gonna have to keep up with yeah. what's happening yeah. tomorrow and yesterday. Like, like a medical journal, you know, physicians, they read the medical journal to keep up with the latest research, to keep up with the latest efficacies. And yeah. so I do the equivalent. It just comes from basically from the broker or, or economist net, uh, uh, network. Yeah. So if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would it be and why? Uh, he's alive. I'd like to have dinner with Warren Buffett. Warren, Warren Buffett, you know, owns Dairy Queen and just about everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand he actually likes the, the burgers at Dairy Queen. But I can do a burger. I, I'm okay with a burger. Maybe hold the fries. But you know, I'd like to have I'd like to have dinner with Warren Buffett because he is probably one of the most level-headed, down-to-earth, successful investors. Or he's a he's an icon. He's an icon. And so you know, it would be it would be a treat to be able to talk with him. And um, if I wanted to compare that 
with uh, uh, a, a completely different personality and image. I'd probably, if I could get Elon Musk to stop flying to the moon, um, maybe, maybe if he could come back to Earth for a moment, it, it'd be fun to have uh, lunch, not dinner. Fun to have lunch <laughs> with a cup of coffee <laughs> with Elon. Coffee. Hey, Elon. <laughs> yeah, I think after a cup of coffee, you'd probably want to. I mean, that guy is uh, is just crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that would be a heck of a contrast in styles. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So that would be fun. But, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So um, if someone's listening and they really want to connect with you or maybe they have a deal or they want to get involved, what is the best way to get a, get a hold of Joe? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Well, I'll just be very straightforward. Obviously, you know, my posts and my profiles, courtesy of you, are, are available on LinkedIn and uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook and Instagram, but I'll just be very straightforward. Please listen. If you're ready, can you write this down? Please, please. Um, my email address is Joe F, F like Frank, at windermere.com. Once again, Joe F at windermere.com. And my phone, once again, please write this down, is 208-699-0764. And I'm pretty darn responsive. So you can be pretty assured that if you contact me, that I'm, I'm going to engage you and we're at least going to be engaged. Yes. I so, mean, 100% I agree with that. If I email you, call you, text you, you're quick on the response. So if you are interested in investing or ready to sell something, get a hold of Joe. He's like quick and smart and knows what's going on. And, and and thank you for that. I appreciate it. And uh, the other the other thing I should I should I should mention is is that those phone calls don't come with a uh, invoice. Uh, those phone calls are introductory slash advisory sort of phone calls, and so those are free. The only thing and the only way I get paid is if we put together a transaction and the transaction closes. But then, of course, as we know, by uh, sellers pay commissions. Um, and, uh, just wanted to reassure you that there's no cost or no disadvantage to having a phone call to see if it fits you or you want to, you want to take the next step into an actual investment. So feel free to call, feel free to call. I'd love to, I'd love to speak with you or, or even communicate electronically. Perfect. My last question for you is, yes, ma'am. Yes, it's been, we're about to hit, we're hitting a brand new year. This we're still yes. in the first part of the first right. month of the year. Um, right. And we don't know what's going to happen. COVID's been crazy. This pandemic's been crazy. We live in a community that's just crazy. Um, what kind of advice would you give someone that's maybe struggling or, you know, is unsure of the future? What's a piece of like positive advice you could leave with someone that's maybe struggling the last couple years? Well, it, it, it kind of, I kind of sound like a parent. So I'm going to date myself and give a little parental advice. But But the parental type advice was, um, hard work pays off. And so don't be discouraged by the fact that it's, we've been hitting walls and different things and parents with kids in school having shutdowns, no shutdowns, etc. So I would say that avoid as best you can being discouraged and trust that hard work pays off. And so don't just throw your hands up in, 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 and let yourself be discouraged. The other thing is do as I say, don't do as I did, which is start investing. Invest as best you can early. You know, $5 a dollar, it, it's amazing how it adds up. And, you know, put, put aside something for the future um, instead of being, you know, more focused on the, on the moment or the present. So that, you know, within 10 years, you would have enough to buy an apartment building. You would have enough to buy um, other sorts of investments. So they're the, they're the two things I would say. That's perfect. Joe, thank you so much for giving me some of your morning today. Well, thank you for having me and allowing me to share my morning. I look forward to, and I, I just want to do a shout out, if you don't mind, anyone listening, um, please do work with Tabitha. She, Tabitha she's great. Um, I usually call her T. So if you yes. hear me say T, don't be, don't ask who the heck is that? That's <laughs> Tabitha. Uh, but please do call her. She is an absolute delight. To work with and I really appreciate her support. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Keeping Tabs. I'm Tabitha Crock and every Monday I release a podcast about different community members here in North Idaho. 
And then we end the weeks on Fridays with a podcast about the things I'm passionate about, outdoors, adventures, sports, the van life, and even current events. So if you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube, Spotify, or iTunes. Thank you again. Now go be kind and do something great.